I'm going to lose my gay card for being on time. Or at I least know. <laughs> almost. What are you doing? What? Nothing. I've only just bothered to look at you. What are you doing? Are we live? Oh, oh my just... God. <laughs> I've just no, I just no, we are, and I've just heard myself in six different tabs. Uh, <laughs> such an amateur. Uh, um, no, I just finally bothered to look at you, and you're smoking on a doorstep, which I is just, I, I not didn't know unusual. We were I didn't know we were live. I, not <laughs> unusual for you, but th thanks for showing people the respect they deserve. Um, yeah, no <laughs> this, uh, this is Chadwick Moore. Thorn in my side, and today well, he's technically the boss. Today, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit before we get into the fun about the nominal, the putative, the supposed whatever title of the live stream today, and that is um, addressed at my dangerous subscribers. And that's not most of the people, well, some of the people listening, but not all of you. It is the people who have been paying for a podcast they have not been receiving recently, and who also came on in the early days um, being promised a signed copy of, uh, of my new book. And I wanted to address those people um, today and then we'll have some fun later. But before I do that, I want to talk to you a little bit in a way that I never have before about the events of the last two years. I just felt myself slipping into Dr. Christine then, just like, you know, like two years ago and that, has ruined my life. <laughs> um, no, I just, I've got to, with these characters now, I've got to keep them out, 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 out. Um, after the BuzzFeed story came out, I'll leave that in the past, combination of, of mischievous misrepresentation and disloyalty and betrayals and all the rest of it. The next big thing to happen to me, which some of you will remember is, uh, well, I'm going to tell you what was reported because some people, people sometimes get mad at me for not saying everything that I know uh, or giving the full background story. But, but when I make a deal with somebody, I stick to my word. I'm not a liar. I don't lie in print. I don't lie to people. Very often that's not to my benefit. So I'll just, rep I'll just tell you what was reported without embellishing it any. It was reported that uh, the Mercers, investors in Breitbart and supporters of the president and Steve Bannon had withdrawn support from me uh, with Bob Mercer saying that, uh, you know, basically that I was too much beyond the pale, too hot to handle all the rest of it. What you didn't hear at the time was that he had simultaneously cut ties with Steve Bannon, but they decided to go sort of public with the criticism of me most harshly because I'm the one that always attracts all of the firepower. Unless it's Trump, people get most mad about me. So that was the sort of first big terrible blow because I don't care about press from the left, and that's always that stuff's always survivable. But when you don't have working capital to run a company, that's when things start to go really wrong for what was at the time called Milo Inc., which was a big media company we were trying to do publishing of books. We did manage to get Pamela Geller's book out, a couple of others, obviously Dangerous, which sold like gangbusters. Um, we were trying to do live events, which became extraordinarily just the most, it was the most incredible, Kafka-esque experience that I've ever been involved in trying to get live events done in the United States with my name on the on the um, on the ticket. Nobody nobody goes through what I go through, uh, and that is the case for for all of these things. Um, and it's fun. It's exciting. It's a challenge. I'm not a victim. I mean, I'm like I have a perfectly nice life, but it's a reality that it is enormously complicated and messy and and time consuming and and staff intensive. Trying to trying to get anything done. So the events business was not going great. Merchandise wasn't bringing in a ton of money. We had to downsize. And eventually with the, the book revenues, although Dave, Dangerous did really, really well, I wasn't able to play live. And aside from writing books, really I'm, I, like to, I think of myself as a live act in addition to thinking of myself as a, what am I, a recovering celebrity? A form, former icon. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna change all my bios to former icon. Uh, so it, it, 
we just we, we we were heading for for a financial crunch. Now I went into journalism a very wealthy person, but I've burnt through a lot of my money while I was at Breitbart, while I was on the Dangerous Faggot tour in colleges. That cost me, I think it cost me all told about eight hundred thousand. Cost investors of that tour, I think one point two million. On top of that, it was an expensive thing to do, and. Um, we sort of entered a crunch and I had to start laying people off. And then we got to a stage where I was going to have to lay off core staff really at the backbone of the business, effectively shut the business down if we didn't have a sizable new revenue line coming in. So the people that I had running the company were doing the best they could, but were not succeeding in, in keeping us afloat, keeping all these people, you know, we had a lot of people on staff in, in retrospect, you know, too many. And so I agreed to do, which was not my idea, and it wasn't in my heart, I knew that it wasn't what I should be doing. I agreed to do a daily paid video, we called it a show, but it was really just me talking to dead air. And it, from the first, I mean, there were so many technical f fuck ups in the launch, and so many. I just, I, by that time, I think everybody was frustrated and demoralized and irritated, and I was still like, come on, guys, come on. But people were just kind of getting a little bit, I don't know what they were, but they, they weren't exactly performing at their best, and the launch was a bit fumbled. We got, you know, three, four thousand subscribers, but it wasn't what I was hoping for, obviously. And two things happened. One is that I got sucked into the sort of daily drudgery of doing an hour or more long, you know, hear some talking points about the news today, kind of like look at what's on drudge and say something right wing about it. And that started to suffocate me. And the second thing is that I cut off my access to my own audience because all the stuff was behind a paywall, except for like a minute or two of it. It was in retrospect entirely and completely the wrong model for me, the wrong product for me, the wrong format for me. And unfortunately, I didn't, at that time, I didn't have Chadwick as close to me as he is now. And I didn't have good people advising me and telling me, look, I know that you think you have to do this so you can pay everybody salaries, but this is not right for you. And it wasn't. And I slowly started to feel drowned by it and suffocated by it. And that's why the show's sudden started to get a little bit um i understand why people thought i was kind of losing my mojo or something and to be fair i was because i was doing i had been on top of the world and then i was reduced i suppose if you might say to kind of talking to dead air to like a couple of thousand people from a front room that had been converted for twenty thousand dollars into a studio uh in an apartment block you know uh, 10 minutes walk from my house and it just all felt like it felt like the end and slowly I started to hate the thought of getting up and going to do it. Uh, the show was not bringing in new subscribers because the marketing model was wrong and nobody would listen to me about what we had to do with it. Nobody would do what I knew we had to do with it. And I just felt like I was in a hamster wheel with ever diminishing returns and not able to make a good product. We had no resources to fly me to places so I could go and like confront people, like not even plane flights really. And I just started to lose my mind and lose the will to live. And I think the key thing was that I just didn't have anyone to talk to or to play off. Just talking into dead air like a radio show or a podcast or something just didn't suit me. And it wasn't what I was supposed to be doing and it wasn't the right thing for me. And even this format is better because I've, you know, I've got people like talking there. I've got Chadwick, I've got, you know, even this is like, I enjoy, I love doing this. Uh, and so we've come up with something new that we'll talk to you about a bit later, but I want to first address the people who uh, have stood by me from the beginning and who are getting a bit cheesed off the British expert. Do people know cheesed off? Is that a thing? Do you know that? No, I don't know. I think cheesed off is a thing here. What do you have? Ticked off? Ticked off, pissed off. Okay. I've upgraded. Yesterday it was vodka and apple juice, and now I've got proper scotch because <laughs> I've been I've been dreading this all day. It's not <laughs> it's not especially great, but it is it's Glen Morangi 12. It's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not really a scotch drinker, but I didn't want to buy a whole bottle of something because I don't know. <laughs> plow through it with you, the alcoholic on the line. I've got so, hello espresso, uh, especial. Just uh, what is that? Uh, some beer. I don't know. Mexican. You know, I like to support the Mexican people. You'll be sucking on a Mexican. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I. Where was I? I've lost my thread. I don't want to get drawn into making fun of you for an hour because that's what we do at the end of the show. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, you, you'd lost your mojo. You dreaded going in every day. Uh, it wasn't thanks, mojo, thanks. Right? You thanks. enjoyed that. You yeah. enjoyed that. You enjoyed yeah. giving that little recap, didn't you? Um, I, I bought champagne for this. Just for this, be uh, <laughs> for this live stream. Be aware that I can mute you. Uh, so. so <laughs> like I said, I went in. I went into journalism. It's, it gets worse than this, and it not only gets worse than this, but it gets surreal and ludicrous. So I went into journalism with, you know, with money of my own. You know, spent very liberally. You know, when you've seen me kind of like splashing out on expensive haircuts and all the rest of it, that's not company. That's my money. Um, and so anyway, it just got to the stage where the show wasn't making anything, and we had to keep trimming down and down and down to the point where I was just wandering in and babbling for a bit. And it and and we we had to stop doing video because the video couldn't pay for itself. We can you know the video team was, you know it's like two people plus the equipment plus the rental plus all the rest of it. It's a lot of money, versus just talking into a mic. So it eventually became just me. This is this is this is how bad it got. Uh, it eventually was just me talking into my iPhone and just posting it up, just babbling for forty five minutes. Um, and it it brought me pretty low, and I in the end, just didn't want to do it anymore. And I, I stopped publishing the shows, but people were still obviously signing up and, and hoping that I was gonna do something. So this is where the story becomes slightly surreal. And I don't mind telling you about this because it's been reported now anyway, and I don't think anybody will mind. Uh, an heir to a very large American fortune, um, and he was a scion of a dynastic uh, uh, tradition of wealth. Uh, there's a university named after this family. There are multiple foundations named after this family. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Came in and said, look, you have so much potential. So you're so br brilliant and talented and blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, well, yes, thank you. You're right. Um, and, uh, I'm going to give you a second chance and I'm going to cut you a check and let's see what we can do with this. And so I was staying at the Bel Air Hotel at his expense. When was this? When did that Politico story come out? Was it six months ago, maybe? It's the most surreal thing in the world. Yeah, so I think so. Ago, I'm in the Bel Air Hotel. I'm supposed to be meeting this guy the following day. And if you Google around, there's a Politico story about this. You can find out who it is. But I just, there's certain things that, as a gentleman, I've made agreements that I won't say. But it's out there, so I can point you to it. Um, he died of an overdose, having been clean for weeks. He had a long history of of drug addiction the night before he was supposed to come sign papers and cut me a check to reboot my career and life and all the rest of it it was like the universe was just saying <laughs> no, no, well you tried um and it just i found it very difficult to motivate myself after that to be really honest with you and that's when i started spending my own money on keeping people paid um you know, I'm a tech guy and I won't embarrass anybody in this chat, but it just, it's when I started digging into my savings and, uh, you know, just, just to keep things afloat because I felt a moral obligation to the people who had stuck by me as employees. But at that same time, there was a, there was an obligation or there was a sort of um, a debt building with subscribers who weren't getting what they paid for in terms of, you know, video show. And also the first, I forget now, I think it was the first two and a half thousand subscribers or perhaps the first 5,000. Um, were promised a, a signed copy of my next book, which at that time was going to be Despicable, the book about um, Spacey, Weinstein, uh, sex abuses in Hollywood. Now, I spoke a bit yesterday about why that book hasn't come out yet, and I think most subscribers know that, but I'll just recapitulate in case you are not familiar. Um, this is a There's a reason that even Ronan Farrow hasn't announced a book like this yet. It's because the moment that you say you're going to do it, the lawsuits will begin to descend. And indeed, I have had lots of legal letters from people uh, who are, you know, don't you dare even think about writing this book because we're going to rip you to pieces. Um, the burden of the burden on an author when you publish a book um, 
is very much greater than when you write a piece of journalism or you do a video on the internet or you post a tweet. Books are considered more permanent. So there's a higher standard of proof involved. If you, if you say something about somebody in a book and you can't not just persuade somebody of it, but prove it in court with evidence, you're in trouble. So a lot of the kinds of reporting and sort of commentary I wanted to do was very dangerous because the way that the American legal system works is, is very tied up with who can outspend you. I was outspent by Simon & Schuster when they screwed me over um, with Dangerous. Now that ended up working out very nicely for me because I'd spent you know, 100, 200,000 on the lawsuit before I dropped it, but I made millions on the book by just going and publishing it myself. So, hallelujah. Um, However, with books, you've got, to, you've got to be able to prove pretty much everything you allege, and you've got to make sure you're on the right side of copyright and all the rest of it. And when you, if you're writing a book about the sexual excesses of a lot of very rich, very famous people, it's sort of kind of a guarantee that the book's never gonna, <laughs> never gonna see the light of day. Now, this wouldn't have been a problem for me, except that getting the book, what we call legal or lawyered, which is having the book reviewed by legal professionals beforehand so they're, they're satisfied that the major claims you make in the book, especially the uh, more outrageous or shocking or damaging ones, you have evidence for, and you have reason, not just reasonable cause to believe, but you can prove. So if you say, so and so, you know, director X molested person Y, that's an enormously high burden of proof. If you say person Y says he was molested by a famous producer, you still have a, you can't, I mean, random people can say random shit about anyone, right? You, you have a responsibility when you write a book to show that you've done everything possible to try and find out if it's true, yada, yada, yada. I don't have the money to get this book legaled, nor do I have the money to defend from all of the lawsuits that will descend upon me when it is published. So the first thing I will say about that book is, I mean, I've done another book in the meantime, I've done Diabolical about the Pope, and I've got two more books coming out. Uh, one about Australia, which actually is gonna be, I've realized this is some of the best stuff I've ever written is in this book, so I hope that Americans read it too. And um, another book that I haven't announced yet, which should be out in time for Christmas about feminism. It's a sort of greatest hits, lectures, columns, or, or everything that you ever need to know about feminism, kind of like a handbook for young men, you know, it's like a survival guide to feminism which hopefully will be a nice kind of long, slow burn, kind of like a perennial Christmas gift, you know? So um, I put a lot of work into that and, and it's, it's, it's fairly encyclopedic. I think it's really good. The first thing I'd like to say to subscribers is that I'm sorry that I, I haven't been doing what you paid for. And I'm sorry that you didn't get the book you were expecting. Um, and uh, I apologize for that. So what I'm gonna do is the following. First of all, I'm gonna give you the audio versions of all three of the books that are out so far or are coming out in the next couple of months for free on your private um, subscriber podcast. So, you know, you get your personalized URL on the podcast. Uh, payments, by the way, have stopped on the website. All payments have stopped on the website. We're not taking new signups. No more money is going to come out of anybody's bank accounts. Uh, anybody who's really upset about the last couple of months of monthly, you know, 499s or whatever, we'll take care of you. Um, all of this information is going to be coming out by email. The three books that I'm releasing, one of them that I just have and the next two, I am at my own expense going to fund, because it's not as simple as me just saying, oh, here, have the audio, because I've got agreements with all the publishers of all these different books. So um, I will at my own expense or strike a deal with a publisher to take a lesser percentage or whatever, give all of you the full professionally produced paid audible, you know, audio copies of all three of those entire books. So that's your 50, $60 annual fee covered in that. But I'm also going to be doing some other stuff as well. And I want to, to read that through with you um, now. And I'll show you just, I'll show you the email I just sent out. Um, so just give me a second, because I'm going to, um, let me just pull this email up for you so I can read out what I'm going to do for you. Uh, Little application window, where is it? There it is. <laughs> oh, I think you have to, there we go. Let's give me a second, chaps. I sent it to myself so that I had a copy for you all. Uh, there are we. 
just a moment. There we go. So I just sent an email out to subscribers, and I promise we'll get on to good stuff in a minute. Uh, I just want to make sure that I do this because people uh, deserve this. They're, they are owed this. So here's the here's the email that I just sent out, and it says, um, apologies, which we won't get into. Uh, existing subscribers, um, first of all, I'm not going to be doing the daily podcast anymore. It doesn't suit me. I hate it. I've come up with something new that I think that you're going to really love. Uh, I think it's a great I think it's the perfect format for me. It's what I should always have been doing. It involves singing, uh, playing characters, doing interviews. Um, this is what I should always have been doing. So forgive me, I'm sorry, but I can't, I, I'm not a conservative talking head who can be strapped to a desk looking on drudge and just, you know, rattling conservative talking points at you. It's suffocating, I hate it. It makes me want to kill myself. It's not who I am. I'm a performer, I want to make you laugh and make you think, and it, I can't be a carnival barker, and I can't be a shock jock, and I can't be any of those things. It just isn't who I am. So I'm not gonna be doing that anymore. Nobody's having any more money taken out. I'm not taking new signups for the time being, but here's what I'm gonna do for you if you have been paying so far. You're gonna get a free full length audio copy of all three of my next books, and Diabolical, the Pope book, you're going to get tonight. As soon as the our live stream finishes, I'm gonna upload the entire thing on your podcast feed so you have the whole thing for the weekend. Um, that's a good six or seven hours, I think. Anyone who subscribed for any amount of time whatsoever since the show began, we're gonna call you legacy members and you're never gonna be charged for anything ever again. Uh, the reason we've turned new signups off is so we can get a proper accounting of all of the people who've paid for stuff so far and who have ever paid for stuff and put them in this special category. And you're never gonna have to pay for anything I ever do digitally ever again, provided I have control over it. And I will, if I, you know, in, in 10 years time, if I, you know, things change and I sign up to do a show for somebody else and, and for some reason that I can't um, control that, I don't have control over that. I, I will work something out. But in the meantime, there will be premium stuff coming. That's what we're doing in January. It's gonna, and, and I finally found a format I love. You will never have to pay for anything from me ever again. Uh, and I'm gonna record a pilot soon, which I think you're gonna love. Um, and if you live in any of the cities we're recording that pilot in, by the way, you will have your legacy membership guarantees you a live audience ticket to every live show recording. And that will give you a little hint as to what we're gonna be doing soon. Now I'm setting up um, a priority email address, which is just for subscribers. So um, I'm gonna get through all this soon and we're gonna have fun. Um, I just wanna make sure that subscribers are, are clear on what they're getting and then I'll go back to abusing Chadwick. So, so stick around for that. Um, I'm setting up a direct priority email address for these people so you can email me directly. Uh, you never have to um, worry about going through customer service. I'll take care of you. Um, there's about 10,000 people that this uh, covers and I realize that sounds like it's a lot, but actually not very many people email that often. It's a very small percentage of people who have problems. Um, but this email is not just for that. It's it's We're a family now because you've stuck with me and I want to say thank you. So I'm gonna give you that um, personal email that comes direct to me and that is gonna take priority. When I'm doing my uh, fan mail, which I do three times a week, um, you will come first. And if I don't, if I only get through you, then I'll only get through you. And that's for anything, uh, dating advice, help with an essay, whatever you want. You'll have an open uh, thing to me. You are still going to get your signed copy of Despicable as and when it's released. I can't give you a delivery date on it now. It may be years, but when it comes out, you'll get it. And I'm also gonna give all 10,000 of you, it's about 10,000, I think, um, a credit for a free Milo ringtone voicemail or short video message from the Dangerous Christmas Store. So if you want me to do you a quick five, 10 second, it will just have to be five or 10 seconds uh, message um, to, to your feminist sister or your brainwashed teacher or whatever it is, I'll record it for you. Or if you just want a funny ringtone or voicemail message or SMS tone, you can get that for free instead from the store. Um, that you will have the code for that within the next 24 hours. Um, your legacy member status is gonna give you the earliest possible access to all future ticket sales, interviews, content, merchandise, discounts on everything. You're going to get black status. So um, we have a we're Black Friday, every day is Black Friday in the Dangerous Store, meaning if you are African-American, you get 10% off all your purchases. Well, I'm gonna roll that out to all of my legacy members. So you're all honorary blacks. Um, you're gonna get, <laughs> you're gonna get lifetime black status. <laughs> <laughs> in the dangerous store. So you get 10% off everything all year round forever and some other stuff and I'll keep it coming and I'll keep being good to you. Um, that's, that's where I want to leave that uh, because um, I'm gonna bore people who doesn't apply to you to death. Uh, but 
it's been really rough for me and I've been very miserable and it has meant that I haven't always fulfilled my obligations. And for that, I'm sorry. And for, so, for those of you who have, uh, there've been a couple of comments here and there, just sort of like, oh, he seems really beaten down. Uh, for a while, that was definitely true. And I think you can see from last night and tonight that I'm, I'm um, very quickly getting my full fighting strength back. And the other thing I would say is also having some time out of the field, I've been reading a lot and learning a lot and practicing a lot. And all I think they really did knocking me out of play for a for a, a season or two was enable me to sharpen my knives so when i do hurl myself back onto the field you're going to see an a considerably enhanced and improved version of me which i'm very excited by because um i just don't give a shit now i'm just ready to see the motherfuckers burn um but i'm also better at doing it and a bit more strategic about doing it and a bit cleverer about not taking myself down with them <laughs> every time I try to take somebody out, kind of like losing five percent of my own, like you know, uh, uh, favorability <laughs> at the same time. So, twenty nineteen is very exciting. Chadwick, how much can we say about our about our secret projects? About about what, 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 what should we call it? Should we call it um, Project Antifa? Project Antifa. What can we say? I think. Well, if people saw your. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I think a good taste is if, if anybody saw your live stream the first time Dr. Christine Blasey Baggett made an appearance uh, when it, your, that was supposed to be your NYU speech. So we have oh, yes. studio I, audience. That's kind I, of a, that's I think a, a good teaser. Although we're going much bigger a, than that. A very yeah. a very slight early frisson, just a slight something, just a little je ne sais quoi, just a little just yeah. a, little, a little feeling, a little. Mm just of, the, of, 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 of what it might eventually become. Uh, I will tell you, I have secured funding to record a pilot of the new thing. I have realized, many of you told me that it was a mistake going behind a paywall, and of course you were right. And I knew that at the time. Um, I have listened, this will not be the case anymore. The, what we're doing, our new project will be, I think, we'll, I think that what we'll probably do is just say, give us an email address um, so we can send you some, we can bother you with things later, free to watch. It's going to be, we're going to record the pilot before Christmas because I have funding for that. And then as soon as we have the pilot, we're going to raise money for the rest. Um, it's, put it this way, it's what American television is missing. And you can fill in the blanks there yourself, but know that I'm a great interviewer, uh, a very good debater, very good at playing characters, and I can sing. So cast your mind back to the golden era of television and to the things that perhaps your parents enjoyed watching uh, in the in the evenings at the weekends. The sorts of shows uh, that 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 might that that might conjure up for you, and that's what we are uh, what we are gently edging towards. So I think that I think we'll probably release the pilot publicly. Don't you think so? I think yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think we should. Yeah. And uh, okay. I think I think this entire thing got started by you just saying all i want to do for a living is dress up in costumes all i want to do is <laughs> all i want to do is dress up in costumes. All, all i want to do is all i want to do is pretend to be other people and really <laughs> fuck with liberals and really get under the skin of people who are not normally ridiculed because yeah. i mean i i've i i am as good as anyone else at the you know oh smackdown you know debate like oh no he didn't viral moment whatever but there's a lot of that shit going around and i like to always be doing the thing that's coming next so the thing that these people hate the most and the thing that never really happens to them is powerful incisive hilarious and damaging satire that's kind of like sticks that that becomes permanently associated with them because of really great comedy of the kind that there just isn't very much of on television in general, but there especially isn't any of from anybody at all, anywhere on television that, do you know what? I'm actually gonna read just the first, the opening statement or some of it from our business plan, because it doesn't go into any details about what you might see, but it sets out what the, it sets out the, what do you call it in, I've forgotten it's so long since I was a technology journalist. I, um, I will say something it, right now. Let me pause you for a second. Do you have super chats open? I think so. Yes. One of our friends just texted me that someone donated five hundred dollars just now. 
What? Cynthia, yes. Give, give, give her, uh, Cynthia, he just said. Our, our tech guy just texted me that. Oh my goodness. Who yeah. is this person? Cynthia G. Oh my goodness, she did. Well, listen, um, that Cynthia, thank you. Um, and 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 uh, the good news is that Google only takes thirty percent of it. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know if I'm kidding. I think it is. Uh, no, thank you so much. That's that's going to go to keeping uh, Chadwick in food and water with a roof over his head. I'm probably going to have to use his flat I'm as the studio. <laughs> I'm probably going to have to use the flat. His flat as the studio. I, 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 I stayed with him before. And I said. What do you need three rooms for? I mean, you know, you've you, you got a kitchen, you've got an office, you've got a bedroom. I mean, what do you need all this space for, Chabot? You live in the, you live in a palatial 150 square foot mansion uh, in, <laughs> in Brooklyn. What do you need all this room for? It's true. I'm, I'm probably gonna gut his office and turn it into the studio. Um, I don't know if you knew that before, but I just. Uh yeah, here you are playing a character again. I'm the one who said you should use my office. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm dying to get uh, there to paint it for it to be painted and remodeled, so I'm happy with that. Oh, oh, I see. So you yeah. you have you yeah, oh, I see yeah, you've, yeah, you've manipulated yeah. me into giving you yeah. a free renovation. Yep. I see. I see. Well, this that doesn't surprise me at all. That's, that's, that's <laughs> t typical. Typical. Um, thank you, Cynthia, and thank you to the other people who are, who are chipping in, and I will make sure that those um, that those contributions go uh, directly to um, making this the success that it needs to be, that America needs uh, for it. So, and thanks, Tom, for calling. Um, I'm going to read you uh, so that you are, are happy about that, um, uh, so that you you, are, you get excited about it. I'm going to read you kind of like the, the statement um, that we wrote that sort of sets out the market opportunity. So if you give me a second, I'm just going to find it because it's in it's I'm I am one of those OCD gays who keeps things elaborately filed in this very complex. Oh no, I found it. Okay. So it's all right. terrifying your level of organization. It's 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 unnatural. Well it's also not really very in character because I'm kind of a yeah. fucking mess. But I think the only way I can be a mess is to um is to is to actually is to have kind of have my shit together, but only in secret so people don't know. <laughs> I'm not lying when I say it's genuinely frightening the level of your organizational skills. All right. Um do you know what I'm actually gonna read this to you rather than um have it up there. Wouldn't it be nice to turn on the TV on a Friday night and be able to laugh? at the comical absurdities of campus social justice warriors and the brazen hypocrisy of race-baiting Democrat politicians. Wouldn't it be a delight to have a show that fuses comedy and commentary, free from the journalistic limitations of a conventional news program, but with the same level of talent, production, and writing as the best the left can offer? People who do not share the wacky progressive politics of the media establishment have nothing to watch on television. We either suffer through real time or simply switch off from entertainment news entirely. There's a glut of center and far left entertainment programming on television and streaming services, much of it poor. But there's nothing for the 60 million Americans who voted for Donald Trump or the enormous general conservative and libertarian market. Only I can fill this vacuum. There's no close second to me in comedic talent and uh, no disrespect to my peers on the conservative side. I wish them all the best and I watch many of them. I'm friends with many of them, but they're just not as good as I am. And that's one of the reasons the left has come for me as hard as they have. And the last year and a half has been so difficult for me. The Mashable published this piece, you know, Miley Opus is proof that no platforming works. They gloat about what they do to us because they know that it's effective and I'm their greatest example of it. They failed with Trump and they, almost um, succeeded with me. But I'm back because they didn't kill me and I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I am a gifted comedian and I'm a proven brand with you guys as well. This is for the business people, this is for the money people. Um, without a single review or interview, Dangerous, my book sold across all media and uh, uh, in all formats and in all different you know book clubs and all the rest of it, two hundred thousand copies now i know that jordan peterson has done vast numbers but he has been reviewed by every outlet imaginable he's been interviewed by every outlet imaginable and he still only sold a million and a half i was not reviewed my book was not reviewed by a single media outlet i was not interviewed by a single media outlet. And yet I sold 200,000 copies of Dangerous. That's equivalent to like a triple platinum record. 
you know, um, because books are so difficult to shift because people don't really buy books. And I say in the in the proposal, um, Milo's been languishing in a fallow period. You know, someone told me the other day I should describe it in uh, I should describe it in Maoist terms. I should say this is my long march. Um, I've been languishing in a fallow period post Breitbart, but retain a loyal audience of millions, despite uh, desperate for new content. But I need a new vehicle to harness my talents. Now, as a working title for the show, um, Friday Night's All Right. And this is that show to be recorded weekly on Thursdays for broadcast late Friday afternoon. I will play every character on the show, bringing my unmatched gift for satire and commentary to bear on characters. Sorry, this is written like this, but it, you know, it's, it's, for, it's for potential donors and whatever. Um, to bear on characters. So I will play, I will uh, do um, imitations and send-ups and satires of people from both sides of the political divide. So Rachel Maddow as well as Jordan Peterson. Um, and it will reflect my values and the values of the people who like me, um, which are of course free expression, limited government, capitalism, property rights, uh, gun ownership, the rule of law. Uh, it will express skepticism of Islam and feminism. It will express horror at abortion and the generally authoritarian instincts of the left. And it will defend these values while exposing corruption and hypocrisy through the lens of laugh out loud humor in the way that only I can really deliver it. And it will also make figures of fear into figures of fun. I'm the only person who has given it to Christine Blasey Ford with both fucking barrels. Um, and that's what I want to do every week. I want to have a show where if the big comedy character in the news this, well, what would it have been last week or the week before? It would have been Brenda Snipe, mm, yeah. the uh, Broward County, um, the, the, the disreputable, dishonest, corrupt, like whatever the hell she... Don't you want to watch a show on Friday night that opens with a send up of her, the kind of person that nobody would dare uh, to, to really take to task in a, in, at a standard with a quality and being f funny enough that it could be on HBO. That's what I want to do for you. And that's what I'm, and, I, and I'm, I am not a fan. I, it's not like I don't believe in it. I just, maybe it's because I'm British, I'm uncomfortable with it. I don't want to crowdfund. I don't want to ask people for money. Um, especially not because I didn't deliver on the last products, which was very different and it was wrong for me, but I, I still, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable with that. So I'm gonna go get the money from big donors because I want you guys to have this for free and I want it to be fucking massive. Um, I want it to be the best show on TV that's not on TV. So, I mean, I kind of have given the game away here a little bit, but I see no reason why not to. Uh, Hard-edged political warfare, I continue, uh, has enjoyed variable success in the past few years with attacks on Trump supporting and other conservative journalists, activists, politicians, and other figures escalating, but no one has mastered the one medium that tyrants truly hate, through which the excesses and abuses of the left can best be exposed, and that's comedy. There are some people who are funny, but they're not raw comedians. There are commentators who try to be funny. And in the, in most cases, I'm not going to mention any names, so I don't want to be mean because I was very mean to somebody yesterday who is probably still curled up in a ball about it, who incidentally had a attempted a career as a comedian. Um, there's no point put singling out anyone in particular, but they're not good enough. They're not funny enough. They're not talented enough. And I'd like to have a shot at it myself because I think I am. Um, so it's a libertarian center-right show, aspires to the standards of the best late-night television from the past half century. I want it to attract self-identified leftist viewers to... Can you imagine what a winner... You know, like, we will watch sometimes leftists imitating or poorly, try, poorly imitating Trump. We'll watch an SNL or whatever because, I mean, fine, let's see if they're funny. And sometimes they are funny. Um, I... Some people won't like me. Won't like me saying this, but I thought Michelle Wolf was quite funny at the, at the at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. She wasn't even handed, and she would have been funnier if she'd gone for both sides. But some of those jokes were good. I mean, I didn't. I don't have the same horror at people who make jokes about people's appearances as many Americans do. So I know that I have to be very light touch about that in future because it doesn't go down well on either side. But. I quite liked when she, she, I mean, the joke about Sarah Huckabee Sanders playing, um, what was it, Aunt Lydia on, on The Handmaid's Tale, I thought it was really funny. <laughs> it was really funny. And the joke about her eye, her eyeshadow being made of like lie, like ash or something, was it, is it, is it lies or is it, it's probably lies. I thought it was funny. It's funny. We have to be able to laugh at ourselves. 
anyway, I want to take aim at both people, like Dame Edna, like Joan Rivers, um, like all the great comedians of the past. Just give it to both sides with both barrels. But, you know, maintaining my principles, which, of course, do via in some cases, quite far to the right. And in some cases, just, you know, in a, in a sort of socially liberal libertarian center, you know, what I consider to be a common sense middle ground. I don't think anybody else gets it uh, right like that. Um, I want it to be something like the very, very best of Tucker Carlson, The Daily Show, um, Dame Edna, Joan Rivers, Saturday Night Live, and um, and the old Johnny Carson Tonight Show all wrapped into one. And imagine the addressable market for a show like this. Like, why isn't that on HBO? Why isn't it on Netflix? Why is it on Amazon? Well, they're not going to commission it. They're never going to do it because it's too dangerous. It would be too good. It'd be too effective. It would change too many minds. Uh, and maybe a dash of Bill Maher in there, by the way, too. Um, just the level of spit and polish that he has in the show, I think, is 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 um, terrific. They do a really nice, precise, uh, beautiful job of this. This enables me to have an audience in person that I can play off. Uh, and it also is something that I do every week rather than the drudgery of every day. So it can be brilliant. Um, and that's, that's, that's what I want to do for, for you guys. Uh, people always quote Andrew Breitbart's dictum that politics is downstream from culture. I'm reading again. Uh, but vanishingly few actually put this belief into practice, uh, either by producing humorous co entertainment content or by funding it, uh, despite widespread agreement that comedy is the most effective cultural weapon at our disposal. Um, I think the reason I'm going to leave the, uh, you know, any more of that, you just have to leave to your imagination, I'm afraid. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to leave the specifics for later. I, want, I just want to whet your appetite a little bit with that. I think the reason that stuff like this is, has traditionally struggled to get funded and commissioned is that political donors want to see sort of tangible results. If you donate to James O'Keefe, you can see where your money's gone. You can see the stories that come out, the people he exposes, the videos he gets, uh, the scalps, you know, how many people had to quit from the DNC. But a show that just lampoons everybody, but whose underlying message is government, get the fuck out of my way, get out of my life. Um, People who have no right to be in, in our countries leave. Islam is mental. Feminists are wrong about everything. So it's, you know, a show that, that expresses how so many of us believe, and we do so sincerely with good intentions, and we do so with love in our hearts, and we do so with integrity. We do so with the facts on our side. Um, I'm just amazed. I'm amazed it's not out there. But imagine how wonderful it would be, particularly if. Particularly, I mean, look, I'm at the stage now, I'm in a kind of, Chadwick likes to say I've got softer because I'm married and because I'm with somebody who I love and I have great love, you know, I have a great love in my life. I think it's made me more stable. It's made me less hot headed, but I am nonetheless in a kind of burn it all down philosophical space if i'm not in a i'm not in a i just want to see you know I, i'm not in that sort of social justice i want to see the world burn like i'm so done with the world um attitude but philosophically this is why i don't care about publishing things critical of jordan peterson for instance because there's stuff there's stuff about him that's fucking creepy the way he talks about his daughter is weird the way that you know that, that he constantly throws allies under the bus kavanaugh faith goldie me you know it's upsetting and i wish he wouldn't do it and nobody has the balls to say so nobody will say this there's all kinds of shit that he does which i think is amazing and it's wonderful um i'm so i'm glad he exists in many respects and he's he's it's good that there's somebody who broadly expresses the views that we all have in the kinds of platforms and environments that the rest of us are not allowed into but when it really comes down to it he crumbles and he believes all women, as he did with Kavanaugh. When it really comes down to it, he throws allies under the bus. When it really comes down to it, he's a Marxist. And you can read my piece on, you know, on, on Dangerous about it. Now, you may not agree with me, and who gives a shit? You know, it's like, if we don't have to agree about Jordan Peterson. That's, the success or failure of the show is not dependent on that. But I want to take, a, I wanna take um, the gentle satirical lens and apply it across the board and see who stands and who falls at the end of it. Because I happen to think that the majority of people who survive that treatment will be on the right. They will be libertarians, they will be Republicans, they'll be conservatives, they'll be Tories. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult to parody some of the people that I like, whether it's Pamela Geller or, or Gavin McGuinness or whatever, because they're, 
it's difficult to parody uh, uh, people who, who are, are funny, quirky, who don't take themselves too seriously, and who are right about everything. So I think that my big targets are obviously going to be on the left. But you know, if you if you do, I think it matters that I have damaged my career in the past by being an iconoclast, and I think it matters that I continue to be one. So I, you know, I want to I want to take a machine gun to everybody and see who see who's still standing at the end because at the bottom the the, you know, this is very interesting, actually, Chadwick. Maybe you have a view. Maybe you have a view on this. What? Metaphorically speaking, machine gun. You need to clarify. Yes, we that. have to say that. We, we have, have to clarify say that. That, that you know, the metaphor. Do you, know, <laughs> do you know that in my in diabolical, which I don't know if I have a copy off to hand. Oh, you know what I did do though. I'm sorry, I shouldn't show you this because none of you can have it. Uh, but I got some very beautiful leather-bound editions of this book done. I can't give ten thousand of these out to the subscribers. I pissed off. Sorry, um, but. <laughs> I got, I got the paperback rebound in a beautiful handmade leather, hand stamped leather edition, which I basically just gave to the people who um, helped pay for, you know, to, to the book to be done and helped me with research and stuff like that. It's really beautiful. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have some done, sell them as special editions if people like the book a lot. Um, but anyway, the, the, I'll show you the last chapter. The book is about how the Catholic Church is too gay and the current Pope has to go. And do you remember that movie from the 90s with Robbie Coltrane, The Pope Must Die? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Right, so the this is the chapter. So basically, I, the last chapter of the book is The Pope Must Die. And the, obviously what I'm saying is, because the Pope is a lifetime appointment like the Supreme Court, the only way to really change this is for the Pope to move on. Like, so The Pope Must Die. I thought it was funny. Publishers, like, we've got to put a footnote in. We've got, no, I'm sorry, we've got to. You've got to put something in so people know you're not calling for the assassination of the Pope. And I'm like, it's a comedy movie with Robbie Coltrane. And the first <laughs> paragraph of that chapter is talking about papal infallibility and the, and, and, you know, uh, uh, the assumption and Mary. And it's just like, it's quite obvious, isn't it? He's like, no, I know, but people are just gonna screenshot the chapter. I said, is that really what we're gonna do? Are we really gonna make books? We're gonna publish, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna reorient everything we do for not just stupid people, because nobody actually is that stupid, but for people who pretend to be stupid, for journalists who deliberately, disingenuously, manip manipulatively pretend that you're doing something that they know you're not doing. And in the process, like, cost yourself the ability to make a joke or make an incisive point and all the rest of it. I, fuck that. So if I have an hour to myself every week, I will be able to do precisely that. Fuck it. Um, Anyway, that really annoyed me, and I made a point of not reading out the footnote for the audiobook, even though they told me to. I don't even know if they know that I didn't read it out, so they do now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, Diabolical, of course, if you are a legacy member, you'll be... <laughs> <laughs> I should give cards out, except there's 10,000 of you, so it would probably cost about 50 grand just to mail you out membership cards, so not going to do that, but I'll send you one digitally. Uh, Tom, I'll get that done, okay? So people can print them at home. Sorry, but other fan clubs do it. I'm not too. I'm not too cheap these days. Uh, you can have a le legacy membership fan. You know what? Actually, would be really cool is if people print their legacy member fan like uh, uh, membership cards. There'll be a space for me to sign it if they like meet me or see me at a show or mail it to me or whatever. And if you have a signed one, that gets you like special shit or something. You know, like if it's well, the people are just going to forge it, aren't they? <sighs> It's very difficult. It's very difficult um, coming up with this crap. Anyway, that's the idea. It's going to be wonderful. I think I should take some questions. Uh, Chadwick, have I forgotten anything, or is there anything you have to add? Uh, while I while I take a look at the chat, which I've been uh, neglecting, perhaps you'd like to speak for a couple of minutes. Uh, I think I think you nailed it. Uh, you well, you said we we said we weren't going to say anything about the show, but you just gave it all away. But that's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> you know what? Let me just, just read you the proposal I sent out. No, to because I was thinking in my head. I was thinking like, well, why wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think no, I think you got it. I think you nailed it. Um, okay, good. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up the. You might hear this show for a second before I mute this. I can't, you know what, I'm just I'm gonna have to refresh this. It's so difficult, because they have this stupid, oh, no, no, wait, 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 somebody emailed me this, somebody very helpfully, oh God, I've done it myself now too. So someone very helpfully emailed me the 
uh, place. Someone's put, put the camera back on, you beautiful bastard. Okay, fine, well, I will. Um, someone very helpfully emailed me the place that you go um, where all of your super chats are stored. Um, so I think that's the place to go. So you don't have to keep following them and so they don't expire. So let me just find it. Because that was, yeah, that was, uh, the, that's what I was trying to figure out yesterday. Somebody my favorite, my favorite viewer from yesterday because they sent me something useful. I mean, I do, I enjoy the compliments, but what, the, the, something useful. Um, I, there, look, and I found it, and it's wonderful. And I've got, look at this. See, I can I contact people through this? I think I might be able to. So I can send Cynthia a note. Can I do that? I think you can. I believe so. Uh, let's see, Cynthia. Subs I can subscribe to her, which I've done. Uh, I don't know if I can send her a message. Well, if you're still watching Cynthia, just email me at milo at dangerous.com and just put Cynthia in caps in the, um, do you know what Cynthia, you know what I'm gonna do for you? Um, just just email me milo at dangerous.com and put Cynthia in the subject line and I'm gonna send you one of these. Um, I only made 10 of these. There are only 10 in existence. Um, but milo, it's extraordinary. You've got a ton of uh, really hefty super chats coming in. Um, well, I'm going to go and go and look at those. So, thank you very much for all of you. I hope you're excited about this because I'm, I'm, I'm. I think it's going to be wonderful. Um, Cynthia, I'm going to send you. There's only ten of these. Um, they are hand bound, uh, hand stamped uh, editions of the new book. And uh, like I say, I only made ten because I just made them for close friends and people who actually who helped me write it. Um, I'm going to send you one of these to say thank you for, for your extraordinary generosity. So, th thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, if you just email me at milo at dangerous.com and put Cynthia in the subject line. Um, and, and, and um, I'll find some way to verify that it was you, and we will um, we will make sure that we get that out to you. Okay, I'll write I'll write you a note to say thank you because I'm, I'm very grateful to to you for that. Um, what happened? Yeah, somebody just said, made a nice somebody just posted something really nice as of what happened to you was wrong about the pedo stuff. And I hate so on the one hand I don't want to keep going on about it because this is exactly what they try to do. They try to so they try to tie you up talking about bogus allegations so you never get around to reminding everybody that they're fucks who lie who want to rip apart western civilization destroy everything that is good and true and beautiful and decent and real and replace it with with just mayhem with with caitlin jenner and, and amy schumer um but then again it's like yeah i do kind of want to talk about it because it's instructive because it's so fucked up and I mentioned this yesterday. It's, it's kind of like when I was talking earlier. It's like I don't have a burn it. I don't have a burn the house down mood, but I do have a burn the house down philosophy now. It's like if someone doesn't tell the truth, I don't give a shit if you're on the right or the left. I don't care how famous you are. I don't care who you or how rich you are. I don't care who you are. I'm going to say it. And the second I have the money for to to fund Despicable, um, and by the way, there are some Republicans in that book too. Um, I'm going to publish it. I don't give a shit because nobody's shown me any loyalty except for you guys and Chadwick and other employees and all the rest of it. Nobody from the establishment right, nobody from the establishment left, nobody from the press, nobody from, you know, whatever. I have a, a very small circle of really great friends who include one or two A-list stars, of which, of course, I can't tell you. Um, some professors, one of whom you probably know, uh, Rachel Fulton Brown at the University of Chicago, some other people in politics, people that I've worked with for years now, like Chadwick, my husband, a couple of old friends. This circle numbers like, you know, 15 maybe total. And everybody else is like, is a reader or a fan or a viewer or something like this. Everybody in the middle, supposed colleagues, like fellow travelers in the movement, they can all get fucked because I helped so many of these people on the way up. I helped so many of these people. I mean, I gifted these people their careers in many cases. Um, and the lack of loyalty, the only people who've been loyal to me really, and I, sorry if I miss anybody out, I don't mean to do it on purpose, but um, you know, Pamela Gell, Gavin McGinnis, is, uh, Gavin McGinnis has been a good friend. Um, David Horowitz and the David Horowitz Freedom Center has been a rock. Um, there are people who have refused to disavow me, which in, these, in the current climate is not nothing. Uh, Steve Bannon. Uh, Heather McDonald, I noticed in the in the Wall Street Journal, refused to disavow me, which was impressive of and and, and really decent of her, and I appreciated that. Because you know, journalists always is like, oh, what do you think about Milo? Because if you, if you won't, if you refuse, it's like the white supremacy thing, right? If you refuse to disavow David Duke, it's like the Trump thing, like right? if you refuse to disavow David Duke, you must be a white supremacist. If you refuse to say that you hate Milo Yiannopoulos, we're going to start presenting all of the terrible jokes he's made to you as though they were serious political statements or claims of fact, and insist that you defend them 
with a you know a, 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 with a body of evidence at your command, or you're out. And people don't want to play that game, so because they're cowards, and so they'll they'll be like, oh no 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 no. And you know there are other people who have been good to me and who have never like you know whatever. But it's just amazing the number of people with the snakes, the snakes. You know the people who are just just um, anyway. I'm not bitter about. I, I think I'm. You know, I, I perhaps would have been bitter if I didn't have love in my life, and I, that's not a very easy admission to make because it means like if I'd never run into John kind of accidentally like I did, then maybe I'd be really bitter and miserable, but it's true. Speaking of which, well, I... well, are you about to make a joke at my expense when I'm being really serious and, and sincere? No, go on. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Maybe, do, you know do you know what? Maybe we should lighten the mood. Go ahead. Well, you know, speaking of your husband, you know, you, you told me you basically spent the entire afternoon on your knees and it really inspired me to... Oh, don't do that because he's probably furtively watching upstairs and he hates it when I over-disclose stuff like that. And he's right because it is the precious, decent... Campaign. And I'm I wasn't on my knees, I was on my back. Um, but, but it's a... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm starting a social media campaign because I think people need to know that we're thinking of him, we care, we're worried about him, hashtag save John. Why would you say John? But just so he knows he has support. He has support. He leans on me. Um, but well, I, mean, I don't know what's going on. It could be a person. I mean, phys I mean physically. I don't mean like, you know. Emotionally. Yeah. 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 I'm going to get ice because you're a terrible person. Talk to <laughs> <them>. <laughs> That was a terrible thing. I've, been, oh, I've got headphones in the ice machine, so I still tell everybody. That was a, that, I can't believe you prepared that. Ugh. <clears throat> I think it's important that, you know, he may be a support. So, you're, uh, you're, oh, oh, you're a dreadful, you're a dreadful yeah. person. Well, I want to talk to you about what Laura did today, too. Loomer. Should we talk about that? Oh, God. Yeah. Let's talk, about something else. let's talk about something else. Let's talk about, yeah, it's always fun. Yeah. I've told, I don't think Laura would mind. I think, I think she'd be happy that anyone, well, I'm just talking about her. And I don't mean that as a diss because I love her and I would say just the same thing to her face on stage. Um, I have, so, uh, I don't want to betray any confidences and I don't want to over-disclose anything and I don't want to like say too much, but Laura and I kind of worked together for a little while while she was receiving money from somebody I knew and I was kind of like, I just threw some ideas her way and I think we were helping her with some publishing, whatever. Um, so I've had an opportunity, what I'm trying to say, I've had an opportunity to see how Laura works in real life and she is as crazy in a good way, you know, crazy like a fox, not crazy mental. Um, she, as she seems. But the thing about Laura is, you know, she's made some missteps. The the tire rot thing was funny as hell. And she, you know, actually she came on my, one of the only episodes I enjoyed doing of the Milo show was when she came on and I had a load of pictures prepared. I don't know if, you, so if you don't know this, Laura um, thought that her tires had been slashed and actually they had just rotted. Um, and she just didn't know that. And she just saw this this like line in the tire and she thought that her tires had been slashed and actually they just rotted away. Um, as happens. And so uh, everyone was laughing because she posted this picture uh, and saying, oh, my tires have been slashed. Ah, and, and people were like, uh, no, nah, they're just, it's just rot love. Um, she, she has hurled herself into, into a couple of missteps like that. And they have stuck with her. They are funny. I don't blame anyone for laughing at them. They are really, really funny. And when I had her on my show, I showed her a bunch of pictures and we play. I, I just sprang this on her. She didn't know it was coming. I said, well, we're going to play Rot or Not. And it was my version of Hot or Not. And I showed her five pictures and she had to tell me whether it was Rot or a slashed tire. And she, <laughs> <laughs> she got like, I think she got four out of five. Um, <laughs> but she was a really good sport laughing about it. And I thought, you know, fair play, all credit to you. You can laugh at your, which is not nothing. Like it's not, not everybody can do it. You can laugh at your missteps. Good for you. The same, the same headstrong enthusiasm that has led her into one of, you know, these occasional whoopsie daisies is also what makes her so formidable and so brilliant. And I just want you to consider this, right? Laura is young. She's evolving. She's emerging. She is so brave and so fearless. There was a time when I thought it was wrong to run on stage and interrupt a theater production. Um, Cause I was like, no, that's what the left does. It can't we be better than that? We can't. We have to not only do what they do, but do better, funnier and more of it. 
uh, if we want to win. And she was the one running on stage during Julius Caesar and stopping it and saying, this is wrong. You're just fantasizing about murdering the president. And you know what? She was right. She was absolutely right. And I didn't give her the support that she deserved at the time. Fast forward to today. And Laura, who was banned from Twitter, what was it, just before Thanksgiving, um, banned off Twitter, latest in a long line of, and you don't get banned, by the way, because of how right wing you are, you get banned because of how effective you are. So if you're popular, persuasive and successful, that's what put you in the, puts you in the crosshairs, not whether you're the, whether a Nazi, there's a plenty of Nazis still on Twitter, um, self-avowed Nazis with big followings. What gets you banned is how popular you are and how effective you are. If you're safe, if they're not afraid of you, that's when you get to play in big arenas, you get the New York Times profiling you and you get to stay on Twitter because they're not afraid of you because they know that ultimately when push comes to shove, you will vote the right way, as it were, you know? It's kind of like they'll tolerate you because they know that when it comes down to it, you'll vote the right way. In a sense, it's like, We'll let Jordan Peterson provide this counterweight because we know we need it. And if we don't have somebody, uh, it's going to be bad for us. But when it comes down to it, when something's really on the line, you know, he'll say he doesn't like Trump, which of course he's done uh, a bajillion times. Uh, but more importantly, like the Supreme Court stuff, this, I don't mean to go on about Jordan Peterson, but the Supreme Court thing, this was the literal apotheosis. It was the apex, it was the zenith of every reason he's famous, every reason he has a platform, every reason he exists, you know, the chaotic feminine versus the ordering masculine, blah, blah, blah. What does he choose to do? Believe all women, right? He, and and it, it was so mental and his thrashing around explanations, just, I'm sorry, if you still view him precisely the same after not just seeing that, you know, they always say it's not the crime but the cover up. After that tweet and then his pathetic ludicrous attempt to explain why he might have tweeted it, which persuaded absolutely nobody. If you, I'm not saying don't be a fan of him because he does lots of good things and says lots of good things. Ultimately, I think his philosophy has a, a horrible vacuum at the heart of it. And I don't think it's ever going to take you anywhere, but he says lots of perfectly good things. And I love watching him, you know, out Fox the, the mentals. But if you see him precisely the same as you did before that Kavanaugh tweet, then you're either an idiot or you're not being honest with yourself or with us. I forgot what my point was. What was I saying? Laura Loomer. Oh, yes. She's fabulous. Um, no, Laura, <laughs> Laura has, I don't know how I got onto that. I'm obviously so desperate. Something in my subconscious is like, you know, mm. um, no, the, we're talking about bitterness, John. I'm not bitter because I don't, you know, I'm not bitter because I have love in my life, but I'm also not, I'm also not bitter or whatever because I have been the biggest and I will again be the biggest. And I'm enjoying this period of being able to describe myself as a former celebrity or a recovering icon because I think it, I think it's very becoming. Um, and I know I'll be fine in the long run, like I'm good. But I, and the thing, the reason I don't envy these people, and I'm not speaking out of sour grapes, is I don't want their lives. There is nothing about being Shapiro or Peterson or, or poor, sweet, Down syndrome Dave Rubin. Um, there is nothing I want about you know from any of their lives because they're not happy. Laura, on the other hand, has found some joy in doing something that I think is is a high calling, is a sort of almost like a it's a, it's a moral imperative. She has found joy in making the left's life utterly miserable. She's the one who confronted Michael Avenatti and made him lose his temper just before he was arrested for um, domestic abuse. Did she make him mad enough that he went home and beat somebody up? If so, sorry for the woman, but she kind of did us all a favor, didn't she? <laughs> Laura Loomer is also, no, I mean, I'm joking, but I'm not. Laura Loomer also um, is the one who made Alisa, Alisa Milano disavow the leaders of the Women's March, finally. Well, that's why she got kicked off Twitter. because she's Of thinking, course, because she became, because she became effective. Laura's having a bit of a moment at the moment. Yeah. And that's why they took her out when they did. And look, slippery fucks doing it the day before Thanksgiving. And, you know, it's like, 
they don't just do the terrible shit they do, but they do it in the most obviously mean, venal, vindictive, like, you know, uh, gra it just, it all of it, everything that you expect a fulminating, frothing, right-wing crazy to say about them, they do. And those journalists who are still defending them, I read a piece in Mashable that was like, it was crowing, it was openly uh, crowing was so happy about Laura being booted off Twitter. And I thought to myself, you are the perfect example, you fucking halfwit, you brainless dweeb, um, blogging from, you know, some bedsit you share with four other people in Romford in London or in some terrible shithole in Oregon. You are the perfect example of somebody who think, you know, who wants to, who, who wants, who thinks the crocodile will eat them last, you know? You are an appeaser. And that, I'm sorry to say, is exactly what Jordan Peterson became. Sorry to bang on. I promise I won't mention him again. But it's exactly what he became with the, with the Me Too movement. He became an appeaser. Uh, he said Kavanaugh should, um, Kavanaugh should take the thing and then resign. And then he said because he thought it might encourage the left to be nicer to us. Is he out of his mind? Has he forgotten everything that he's ever learned? No, of course not. He was just showing his true colors. When something doesn't make sense logically, it's because it's revealing a truth that is coming from a drive that runs deeper in us and that is more fundamental to us than our higher logic and our higher brain functions. It is coming from some atavistic um, essential need. And in Peterson's case, it's the need to be liked. Uh, he needs above all else, above everything else, to be liked. And now it seems he's moving into this period where he wants to be liked more by Hollywood than by his own fans. And I'm happy to sit tight and watch that happen. Laura, on the other hand, has never minded being unpopular or embarrassing herself. And that sometimes means catapulting herself into embarrassment, but it also means being braver than the rest of us. And so you fast forward from the, the Caesar thing, which I wish I had defend, I, I wish I praised her more highly because I was asked on the biggest radio show in New York with a huge listener, uh, a huge audience, what I thought of it the following morning. And to my great shame, I said, well, I can't deny I enjoyed watching it, but I wouldn't do it myself. And I just wish that, you know, we, we wouldn't sink to the taxes of the left. I think we're better than that, blah, blah, blah. And that was wrong. That was complete bullshit. I should have said, fuck yeah, I'm going tonight. Um, that's what I ought to have done, and I didn't, and I'm sorry that I didn't, uh, and I'm sorry to Laura that I didn't, I've told her that. Anyway, fast forward to uh, today, uh, and she has, from being banned from Twitter, she's waited until after Thanksgiving, which is obviously really smart, she's waited until after Thanksgiving, and then she's um, chained herself to the door of, of uh, Twitter's New York office, with a sign, it would, which first of all, she's got a yellow Jewish star, like- <laughs> That was the best part. Third Reich style, yellow Jewish star. Because of course, the, one of the reasons she also got banned was for the, the, the tweet that it seems kicked it all off that was like the last straw for Twitter. Twitter, of course, whose majority invest, well, not, I don't know if he's a majority investor, but he is the largest uh, stockholder. Um, Prince 